Welcome everybody. My name is Jackie Malloy and I'm responsible for all projects and communications here at Meaningful Aging Australia. As we begin today's session, let's acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands where we are gathering. And you can hold them in your mind or you might like to write them in the chat and share them with us. For the Melbourne team of Meaningful Aging Australia here on the northern side of Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And at Meaningful Aging Australia, we like to also acknowledge the spiritual strength and resilience of Australia's first people. And we acknowledge them with gratitude for sharing their wisdom and love of land with us. Welcome. Today, we are exploring a fundamental area, a fundamental part of being human. And we're looking at the dining experience, the eating of food and meals and creating experience for older people that is safe, that creates belonging, that adds meaning to their day and their lives. And our special guest is Colin McDonnell, who is a dementia and wellbeing consultant at Calvary SA. He also holds various positions as an adjunct professor with various universities. He's a registered nurse. He's a great storyteller. Um, and that's one of the important ways that we have, of course, to communicate both truths and examples. And we are thrilled that Colin is with us today. Please make him welcome with your silent Zooms. And um, I'm going to hand right over to you, Colin. Thank you very much. Uh, hope you can all hear me. Um... I'd also like to acknowledge our traditional owners and offer my respect. And I'm on in the Awabakal uh, country up in, uh, in near the Hunter in Newcastle. So if I could start with my first slide, and I'd like to thank Meaningful uh, Ageing Australia for inviting me to speak today. So I've only got 20 minutes. I could usually talk for four hours on this. So I'll have to watch myself. So um, let's not forget it's dinner time. And no matter where we are, whether the person living with dementia or any elderly person is either in a residential facility, respite or at home, it's important to remember that it's a dinner time that we happen, is happening. And a lot of times people get stressed out knowing that someone might refuse a meal or someone might get up and walk away from the table. So I just ask you to contemplate what a meal is about and, um, and why we, we do this and why it's important to focus what you're doing before you go in there because 93% of communication is your body language. So if you look frazzled and upset, then the person living with dementia really picks up on that language. So can I have the next slide, please? So what happens when we're first born? The first thing after being smacked by someone and crying is we look for comfort and we look for um, the mother's breast, the food. So it's our, one of our very first reactions in life and it stays with us with for life. And that, that emotion, that comfort builds who we are as a human being. And it's not just humans that do that. It's every sort of mammal in the world. The first thing a baby either a horse, cow, pig, whatever does is suck on the mother. And that's that bonding and that connection that you get from the very first minutes of your life. And if we can just visualize that and look at what's going on, and why is it important? And I think there's no more important than this photo of a human being just born looking for food and comfort from their mother. And to me, if you can visualize that, then you relax and calm down and think, this is really important. This is what I'm going to do now. It's going to help someone connect back to those first feelings from birth. Next one. So homely kitchens, wherever you are, the smell of freshly baked food, uh, lamb, anything like that, coffee, bread. And you can put that on at nighttime, wherever you are on those new automatic bread makers. So, when people first make, wake up in the morning, you've got the smell of food, um, the smell of coffee uh, and things like that going on. And that reminds people and prompts people. Uh, it's just like advertising. They use prompts all the time to try and get you to buy things. Um, the smell of food and the smell of coffee and things 
often remind people and start their taste buds going um, that it's a meal time. Thanks, next slide. Thanks. So what happens when we do focus on opportunities? <clears throat> Residents in all stages of dementia, including end of life, have emotions and need for human interaction and attention. And, and like that very first picture of the baby, it comes from there. And real time is a natural opportunity to address these needs and person-centered care during real times will possibly affect the person throughout the rest of the day. So starting with a really good breakfast and a really good happy time, meeting people when they wake up, and it's best if they wake up when they want to wake up rather than getting woken up by someone else and, and then sitting in a room for two or three hours waiting for breakfast that's not very conducive to people wanting to eat. So that lady obviously is enjoying meals. She's obviously underweight and she's obviously very happy to see that there. Now, a lot of times we stop people if they've got diabetes or some other problem from eating things that they like. Um, and the evidence shows that you don't have to do that for someone who is 80 or 85 years old, even younger, a bit younger than that, because the length of times to take effect from having too much sugar in your body will uh, be really short fused by having a, a diagnosis such as dementia. It's, it's not harmful to have sugar and things and food that you really enjoy when you're at that age, because it will not do any damage by the time we leave this earth. Um, so, the most important thing is to let people eat and enjoy food. The joy of food is wonderful. Next slide. So getting the person ready. So we, what happens when you get in a car? You make sure you go to the toilet before you get in the car as always, and you make sure if you've got any children, that's one of the first things you say, make sure you go to the toilet. So take them to the toilet, go to the toilet, ask them to go to the toilet. And if they've got any glasses, hearing aids, and if you need to adjust your clothes, make sure you do that. So if the person frequently leaves the table, then you can make sure that they have their uh, meals first and uh, also have the good stimulus around that they know that the dining room looks like a dining room and not a multi-purpose room, that it's actually set up and concentrate on your thoughts and things and the feelings. That'll trans transfer across to the person and help them relax and be calm. Uh, minimise external noise. It's nothing worse than walking in and watching the news in the morning about Ukraine and everything else going on in the world, the number of people dying of COVID. Uh, first thing in the morning for someone, it's very distressing and very confusing and all the noise that comes with it. So nice, relaxing music if possible. And people tend to put the radios on the, the stations they like rather than what the, the, the people living there like. So just make sure you're aware of that. And then Use adaptive cutlery and cups and things. So if people have difficulty with arthritis or, or coordination, then um, they, those um, aids help them. And it's really important to make sure that people continue to eat their meal unassisted for as long as possible, because it has been proven that um, the more assistance they need from either a staff member or someone else, the less food they eat and the more at risk of malnutrition they have. Next one. So what are we talking about? Implicit memory, muscle memory. So this is what someone's done all their life. If you're a good football player, you go out and you train and train and train before you go out on the paddock and then it just kicks in. You don't have to think about it. You just do it. And implicit memory is the same with eating. It's the same with cooking. It's the same with whatever you've done all your life. Uh, it's there. It never goes away. Like how you look after babies and I have a I've had lots and lots of a great experience from 20 years ago of introducing babies into dementia specific areas. And the people who um, some staff may think that they can't do anything basically come alive and, and they act, they love, they give love, they receive love, they just do everything exactly the same as a normal 20 year old mother would do and look after the baby, including taking away any risks. And they have instant flashes of just move the cup quick yeah, that baby might. So the mind works just as brilliantly, no matter what stage you are. So that's the, the, the implicit memory and it's step by step procedure. So if you start helping someone by getting them to set the table and then either and or either prepare the meal before that, their steps, their procedural steps that remind people it's now meal time rather than just take someone either from a lounge room at home into the kitchen without any settings and everything else like that and then expect them to eat. It's step by step and you show them, you start with a picture. It's like drawing a picture, 
slowly, slowly add all the extra steps in until they get to the table and the meal, and then they can continue on by themselves, hopefully. And specific feelings and emotions, they feel more and they have a more emotions. So I can guarantee you, you may not think they know you, but they feel you. They feel your love and they feel your emotions and they also feel your frustrations and that's what makes them frustrated. So that's the, the, the things that we should look for is what have they done in the past, their life story, all that, that about them, about meals and everything else like that. I could tell you a beautiful story, but I haven't got time. Next time, we'll have to come back for round two. Next time, thanks. So these are things that you can do. Men or females can do this. You don't have to be females to do be cook or like doing things and laying the towels with cutlery and napkins, clearing away dirty plates, washing and drying up, condiments on the table. People's taste buds change. So people think we can't see anything on the table because they'll take it off and they'll play with it and they'll mix the sugar with the salt. Very rarely happens. Um, and people just get stereotypes that this is going to happen and they don't even give a person a chance to do that. And, and without the extra taste, because the taste buds change with age and also with dementia. So what they used to eat, they may not want it to eat anymore. So it's really important that you don't just judge a person because this is what they've had all their life. And relatives can come in and say to staff, they want poached eggs or porridge, you know, so unless you can say, give a few more options, they'll have porridge for the rest of their life every day. And I don't think many people liking the same breakfast every day. So it's important to understand that you might have to be a detective and work out what they really like. And even if they can't speak, that's by facial expressions and things like that. Making sandwiches, scones. There was a lady I knew who was really get, used to get really stressful um, at meal times um, and other times. So I asked her son, if I can say this very quickly, what did you do? What did your mother do when you stressed her out when you were a boy? And he said, uh, I never stressed my mum out. I said, you were a boy? I don't believe you. I don't know any boy who hasn't stressed their mother. He said, come to think of it, she used to make cupcakes. She'd make 100 cupcakes at a time. So we started her making cupcakes. And lo and behold, she got less stressed. So it's finding out those things. And then the stories of the past, you know, talk to them, uh, engage with them like you would do normally with anybody helping parents prepare food and cooking with the family all that sort of stuff celebrate 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 meal times next one and this is an example of some they, we moved these young ladies from one house where they used to sit in front of a tv because they didn't have a kitchen or anything else like that and we built a special kitchen for them and lo and behold as soon as they moved in there they started cooking and when they started cooking, they started sharing experiences. Can we have this thing? This is implicit memory. Ladies, what are we having for morning tea? You don't want another piece? No, I'm fine, thank you. So I've had some vanilla cake and Marlene, you've got blueberry scones for us. Blueberry muffins. Muffins, thank you for that, ladies. Oh, look, all the maintenance men are here to get their little bit. We got bit. no phone call this week. Just give them the cake. Pardon? Just We've got them. no phone call. What's the cake there? Yeah, it hasn't come yet. You're cooking for the maintenance, man. Uh -huh. Yeah. You want to pass that up to me and I'll hand it out? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. They're gonna go. We're going to take them over to the craft class. So. Well, just, if you just want to sit them down on the bench. Oh, nearly missed that one. That's all right. Sorry. So there you go. One of the hardest things if you're ever working in um, aged care hospitals anywhere is trying to find a maintenance man. So <laughs> if you put the smell of food out there, they just turn up like blowflies. So um, uh, that's a good way if you need something fixed. Just put on a good, smelly, nice cake and, and they'll turn up. And you can see there, that's their own kitchen, that's their dining room, that's, that, they own that and they can go up anytime and start cooking and making things. And that's just a normal thing that they do every day now. It's become part of their life. Um, and that, so that's promoting and, and, and building on that implicit memory that they've had all their life to do the things that they like. And then they've got a sense of purpose. And then people see them more as pers a person again, rather than someone that you have to do for all the time. You do with people, not for people, not to people. Um, so they become participants in life rather than recipients of care. And that's one of the most important lessons I would hope people would take away from here today. Recipients of participants in life rather than recipients of care. Uh, the next one, thanks.
Ah, culture and life state. I was just reading a, a chat there. Did they have to be supervised? They used the big knives and forks and everything else. Basically, we made up and we had the university students uh, come in and they made recipes where step by step. Um, so even if they forget a step, if you didn't have these little prompts, um, then they won't forget it. So they might forget to put self-raising flour in or something like that. So we've made the, the, the recipes up. So the pictures and words, and we've also color coded them so that they, they can do as much as possibly independently for them for themselves um, just by following a recipe which has been specifically enlarged and in and in bold colors so they could read them and they just follow that and then the, the ingredients are in a color container exactly the same as the color for each step of the of the um, recipe so we try to get them to do as much as possible themselves and don't be so risk averse everyone says you know they got knives. Yeah, they got knives. They've used knives all their life. And sometimes they cut the finger when they were 20 and they can cut the finger now if they need to, but you don't have to even, you can get knives now that don't cut skin, but cut potatoes and peel vegetables and things like that. So um, treat people like they're normal and they act normally, I find. So people's histories and cultural background help shape the whole food and eating experience. So if men and all women, if they want to go and feed the chooks, um, grow potatoes, gardens, they make pickles and, and today they're making up their O-ring up and they're making um, choco, uh, whatever, pickles, choco pickles, you know, the old choco vine will grow anywhere over the toilet and all that sort of stuff. So just keep an eye on my time because I'm starting to wander off a bit. Uh, so eating and food and eating can tap into people's life's experience um, and be meaningful and joyful at times. So it's important to know what culture is and culture is really important for someone like either a Muslim or a Jewish who one of their rituals is to wash their hands before they go into a meal. Now, if there's nowhere to wash your hands, they will not eat. They just will not eat. Um, so it's important that you know those things about people's culture. Uh, and so they can wash their hands then you'll have no trouble. Next slide. So good dental care is important. One of the most neglected things in aged care or anywhere is someone's mouth. Uh, people don't often look in someone's mouth. So poor fitting dentures, sores, ulcers, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that last little tip right down the bottom there is really good in case you can't get a toothbrush in someone's mouth and help clean them. Is a glass of milk or a piece of cheese can help neutralize sugary acids and help decays and things like that. So just give them a little wait about half an hour or so after the meal and then just give them a little bit of snack and a little drink of milk and some cheese helps neutralize it. Next slide. Thanks. But it's really, really important that you make sure that the dentures and or their teeth and their gums are really good. Otherwise they won't eat. So what does it mean to you to be a person? And Kitwood had a saying, personhood is bestowed by one person to another. And he meant by that, if you aren't treated like a person, you can't be a person. So if you start to think that they are objects and he calls people uh, in his uh, malignant social psychology, he talks about um, um, being objectified um, like a chair to be moved here and there and to do things too. So that takes the personhood away from the person and they get depressed and they get anxious and they get agitated. So as same as you would, if you were ignored or bullied, um, you wouldn't feel like a person. Next one, thanks. So I person-centered approaches, I believe in God and my faith and traditions are important to me. Next. I only eat kosher food, so please make sure that I'm able to leave. Uh, please respect my life wishes, and that includes the end of life. When you go down there and people start thinking that you have to put in uh, tubes and all sorts of things, um, what did the person wish to have? Um, did they need, did they want those, or did they want to have a natural death? And that's really important. I'm proud that I lived the life I had in making decisions on my own, and I can still share in decision making right to the very end thanks so guiding not telling trying to convince a person living with alzheimer's disease to eat is really counterproductive eat your dinner eat your breakfast eat. can you remember back when your mother used to say eat your greens or eat this or eat that and you became more and more determined not to so it doesn't pay to do that so it's simply a good idea to sit down beside someone have a nice conversation start eating yourself um, and there's other techniques like hand over hand to help people uh, with meals. Um, but the general idea is sit down, relax, smile, look at them in face to face, engage in conversations, and then they'll mirror you 
uh, like a yawn, a yawn becomes contagious. So does if you put food in your mouth, they will put food in their mouth usually. And we had a man who uh, we tried everything. And this is where you have to become a detective. And there's a little clip after this. He wouldn't eat if you left the food and the spoon and the knife beside him. He wouldn't eat if you tried to assist him with a meal. He wouldn't eat for many, many different reasons. And then we found out a way. And I'll show you what it is next if you quit it up. And just note that's a texture modified meal, so don't stir it all together like a lot of people do. He enjoys his food. No, he enjoys his food. That's one issue we don't have. So she just loaded the spoon. It took us forever to work that out. But that ensures that man continues to eat by himself and be as independent by, as, as much as possible. So if you just stood there and, and tried to assist him, he wouldn't eat it. If you loaded the spoon and stayed there, he wouldn't eat it. But by doing that and then walking away, he then picks up the, the spoon and, and eats it himself. And he eats the whole lot. And that, that's the major thing. Never give up. Never give up. Charles, uh, I think Winston, Charles, Charles Winston Churchill said that. Next one, thanks. So exercise increases appetite. So let people try and encourage them to walk, go outside. Uh, nature is a really good healer of everything. Healthy snacks between meals. And sometimes you might have to give more um, snacks if they don't want big meals or they, if they walk a lot. Uh, finger foods, and there's lots of different things you can get now for finger foods. And if a person stops um, and you'll need, if you follow them, you'll know they usually have little destinations where they sit then you can put food down there and they'll pick it up and eat it. They're, they're uh, grazers. So watch for other health problems and make sure they've got sauces and food on their table. Okay. And that's, that's texture modified food there. So that's pureed food. So you can leave that around and not worry about people choking and dying on it. You can get really good molded food now that looks exactly the same. So that's the appearance. It's, it's like a normal meal and they're, they're not separate and you don't get stuff or anyone mixing it all together. So it's just a big mash and doesn't taste like anything. Thanks for thing. And they're different natural condiments that you need. So start watching and thinking, uh, what flavors do they like? Uh, the taste buds are gone here. So I just see that little yellow one. I just see that looks like an eye now. I'm just noticing the very first one. I get amused very easily. So it looks like it's got two eyes and a nose and a face in that, in that first um, orangey, yellowy looking, that one, if you can see that. <laughs> yeah, very amusing, yeah. Anyway, so all sorts of different condiments, particularly if they're from not, you know, uh, Italian, uh, European, Indian, Asian backgrounds. And we've got to make sure that the food relates back to what they've been eating and it goes back to that implicit memory. Uh, next one, thanks. And these here are molded foods and fruits. So if you're having parties and all that sort of stuff or afternoon tea, if you want to sit with your husband or wife in the house out in the backyard and just let them nibble like they would normally nibble. And you can do all this even if they've got a problem with dysphagia and things like that. Cheese, biscuits, there's Oreo biscuits. You can get a whole lot of things that they, so they don't miss out um, on the same pleasures. And that really helps with someone who's losing weight and doesn't want to eat to have things like this sitting around and just nibble together, listen to some music, put your feet up in the sun outside and uh, read a paper or something like that. So there's lots of opportunities now to do things for those even if they can't swallow properly. And I think I'm up to my 20 minutes. And what's the next slide say? Ah, familiar environments. This is really important. Uh, bold colors, people can't see very well when, even if you're a normal age person over 65, you see more yellow, the chrome disappears in your eyes and everything looks more yellow. So, and then you have cataracts, uh, macular dis, uh, degeneration, all sorts of things happen to your eye. And if you've got a white plate on a white tablecloth and you put white rice and white potato on it, they won't even see the table, uh, the plate, let alone the food on top of it. So it's got to have good color contrast and it should be at least 30% difference, including from the floor, the skirting board, the walls, and then you go into the dining room. If the, You've got a wooden table and a wooden chair and a wooden floor and they all look the same colors. They won't be able to 
determine where the chairs are even. So it's really, really important that they look uh, and, and you have different color plates to the placemats and, and, and then the food on top of that stands out. So that's really, really, that's one of the most important things that people can actually eat the food and see the food because most of the times we do it in a way that there's no color contrast they can't see and they've got depth perception problems so if you put the plate right in front of them and don't watch them they might reach across to the other plate and people think they're just trying to disturb the other person but it's that's where they think their meal is because of their problems with the depth perception that happens because of the changes in the brain so then you look and start seeing where best a person can eat or where you best put the plate you know so that they, they don't get confused because if it's right in front of them they won't see it a lot of times so uh, that's the reason why they do what they do sometimes there's always a reason next one please. and water fluid is the most important thing you can live a few days or a few weeks without food but you can't can't survive without water fluid uh, and that's really really important and that can be done you know in in um, several ways with including the, the fluid that's in their uh, food and things like that. But um, it's really, really important. It, it helps with blood pressure, stops people falling over, does all sorts of things. And the more you can help a person have good nutrition, it should be 20 grams of pro, pro, uh, protein three times a day, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's no good having 60 grams of protein just at breakfast time, a couple of eggs or whatever, and you think they don't get any protein for the rest of the day. That doesn't work. So that leads to malnutrition. And malnutrition is one of the greatest risks. So um, pressure areas, falls, uh, low blood pressure, all sorts of things happen in malnutrition. Very, very dangerous. Um, and fluid intake is, and they get more confused as well um and do things that are not normal so it's like a, um, a delirium caused by problems with the diet and the food so uh just like an infection does and then keep an eye on infection because if they've got a scratch or something then and if they start to get confused that'll come from that infection so just watch the little tips to watch and, and if they're constipated once again if they're not good getting good um um, fiber and things like that they'll get constipated they'll get more confused and they want to eat less and then you get and you don't drink and then you get more constipated and you have more problems so it's a vicious cycle that you've got to look at and make sure that they get enough to drink in as many ways as possible including that if it's a little bit of soft drink or something like that but uh, if it's a little sips often and if someone doesn't um, want to start a meal if you give them a sip of fluids first, they probably will eat more likely to eat because they get dry mouth. And if you've got a dry mouth like I have now from talking, um, then you're less likely to want to eat. But And then a lot of medications makes people's mouth dry. So if you just give them a sip before their meal, then they're more likely to eat. Um, and the next slide, thanks. And that says thank you. Oh, thank you indeed.